Uh, welcome everyone to the guest speaker program of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the Institute, and I'm excited to introduce today's talk and speaker because even though we are always, of course, trying to select topics that are important, today's topic is especially so. What does US law say about Taiwan is the first in a series of talks that we are hosting over the coming months in which we will be examining the legal status of the self-governed island of Taiwan, also known as the Republic of China. Through the lens of first US law, then international law, the law of Taiwan itself, namely the constitution of the Republic of China and the law of the People's Republic of China, as well as uh, Taiwan status at the UN. A few years ago, The Economist magazine uh, notoriously called Taiwan the most dangerous place on earth due to fears that the PRC might use an economic blockade or military force to bring the island under its control. When the situation is analyzed, the focus typically is on the strategic and military factors and the relative balance of power across the Taiwan Strait. So what we hope to do in this speaker series that is different is to explore the, law, the role that law plays in the relationships among Taiwan, the People's Republic of China and the US. So today we are asking what US law says about Taiwan and our particular focus will be on the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act, which turned 45 years old this year. The Taiwan Relations Act is frequently cited, but it doesn't seem to be frequently read, or at any rate, it is poorly understood. So with us to clarify its meaning and discuss the impact it's had over 45 years is Richard Bush, a non-resident senior fellow in the Center for Asia Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. For five years from 1997, Richard was the chairman and managing director of the American Institute in Taiwan, which is often described as the de facto U.S. Embassy and is itself a product of the Taiwan Relations Act. Richard had a long career in government, including as a staffer on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and its East Asia Subcommittee, and as a national intelligence officer and member of the National Intelligence Council. He's written prolifically about Taiwan and its relationship with the People's Republic of China and the U.S., always managing to achieve a level of clarity and precision on a topic that many of us find confusing. Richard, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be with you on this crisp fall morning on the East Coast. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak about something other than the U.S. election, although that may come up in Q&A. Um, but um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, uh, if only because it uh, the TRA created one of my jobs. So I'm grateful for that. Um, what I thought I would do um, is present the key points about the TRA and its significance. Um, a thread running through my remarks is the need to distinguish the TRA as law and the TRA as a signal of American policy and political commitment. Uh, it's important first to set the context uh, to identify the undertakings uh, that the Carter administration made to the People's Republic of China in December 1978 in the normalization communique. Um, that was before the bill that became the TRA was introduced in the Congress. Um, and these undertakings affected the legal and political status of the Republic of China slash Taiwan in U.S. policy. Now, the Carter administration did the following. First of all, it recognized the government of the PRC as the sole legal government of China, uh, established diplomatic relations with the PRC government, and terminated diplomatic relations with the Republic of China government. Uh, among other matters, these decisions uh, sharply constrain the possibility 
of Taiwan's membership in state-based international government organizations, at least as far as U.S. policy was concerned. Um, Washington um, also made a commitment um, to conduct uh, relations with Taiwan on an unofficial basis, but it never uh, defined what unofficial meant, uh, nor did it negotiate uh, with Beijing about the meaning of that word in a, unofficial, and it never has. Um, significantly, I think, the Carter administration only, quote, acknowledged the Chinese position, unquote, a very vague term in my mind, that there was one China and that Taiwan was a part of China. That is, the United States did not recognize for itself that Taiwan was a part of the sovereign territory of the state China. Um, we do that for Tibet, but we don't do it for Taiwan. Finally, President Carter reaffirmed unilaterally the U.S. expectation that differences over Taiwan would be resolved peacefully. Now, some observers might point out that Section 4A of the TRA <clears throat> states that whenever the laws of the United States refer or relate to foreign countries, nations, states, governments, or similar entities, such terms shall include and such laws shall apply with respect to Taiwan, unquote. Um, doesn't that mean, these observers might ask, that uh, Taiwan is a country, nation, state, and so on? Um, my answer to that question, uh, and it's a good one, and more importantly, the view of the executive branch lawyers on that question is no. The section of the TRA um, of which this provision is a part clearly concerned the application of U.S. laws. That is, um, it intended to clarify as a matter of law which U.S. laws should apply to Taiwan and which should not. Um, it was not meant to speak to Taiwan's legal status. Um, this provision mandated treating Taiwan as if it were a foreign country, nation, state, or government. But as if treatment is not the same as affirmatively recognizing the ROC as a government of China or Taiwan as a separate state. Um, note that this uh, provision was a much more practical way of achieving this objective and solving this problem than going through every law in the US code and inserting the word Taiwan along with foreign country, nation, states, et cetera. <laughs> um, I raise this example um, to stress that the meaning of the TRA as law is a function of something called legislative construction. And that is um, the effect or non-effect non of the words in the TRA or any other laws on the actions of the executive branch. Uh, just because um, certain provisions uh, appear in a law doesn't mean that that provision is binding um, on the executive branch. So to get specific about Taiwan, when the TRA says it is the sense of Congress that, and there are a whole bunch of items there, um, that is all uh, uh, that those um, that section means. Uh, it doesn't require anything of the executive. When the TRA says it is the policy of the United States to do A, B, C, or D, um, that does not make it so. Uh, the executive branch is what makes policy. Uh, now, it may actually agree with uh, the content of A, B, C, and D, um, but um, that is because uh, those particular items um, overlap with or agree with what is uh, administration policy. Um, but it reserves its the right to itself to make policy. So um, this is um, one example of how the TRA as law and the TRA as 
policy statement um, diverge a little bit. Now, as a key example of this sort of tension between law and policy, let me turn to security issues. Uh, and I have to give you a little bit of background here. When the Carter administration's initial draft of the TRA was introduced, many members of Congress were startled that there was nothing concerning Taiwan security. Uh, they therefore sought to amend the bill, uh, the draft bill, to assert as a matter of law that Congress would play an unprecedented role in policymaking concerning uh, Taiwan security issues in partnership with the executive branch. Most important for them uh, were arms sales and whether the United States should come to Taiwan's defense if attacked. Um, but these members failed in this effort um, because the managers of the bill in the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, working with the Carter administration, uh, wrote the language of key sections in such a way as to essentially maintain the interbranch balance of power, uh, which works in favor of the executive. It didn't um, strengthen Congress's position with respect to Taiwan policy. Now, why did they do this? Uh, they agreed with the Carter administration uh, that the secu the uh, amendments that some members wanted to insert in, in the draft bill were too strong, um, and that the TRA, um, if it was uh, accepted, if it was passed with those amendments in it, might scuttle the normalization deal with the PRC. Um, but they also accommodated to the administration's insistence that the TRA not encroach on the president's constitutional power. Uh, they wish to avoid a presidential veto, and they work, were working against a deadline of March 31st. So the managers of the bill, working with the administration, used uh, certain le legislative language to create the false impression that Congress would have a role in decisions on arms sales and that the TRA contained a commitment to come uh, to Taiwan's defense. Um, for example, uh, the next to final sentence of Section 3B originally read, the President and the Congress shall determine the nature and quantity of um, defense articles and services for Taiwan based solely upon their judgment of the needs of Taiwan. Uh, the administration opposed this language as drafted, but it accepted the addition of this phrase, um, quote, in accordance with procedures established by law. Um, now, the administration interpreted this um, seemingly um, unimportant phrase uh, as a reference to the Arms Export Control Act, which lays out the procedures for deciding on um, arms sales. Um, but it that provision uh, gives Congress a say only at the end of the decision process, not at the beginning. Um, so um, the status quo was preserved. Regarding a security guarantee for Taiwan, uh, these are the key parts of Section 3C. Quote, the president is directed to inform the Congress promptly of any threat to the security or social or economic system of the people of Taiwan, the president and the Congress shall determine in accordance with constitutional processes, appropriate action by the United States in response to such danger. Now the words here is directed to or shall or employed in US legislative construction um, to uh, place a uh, binding requirement on the executive. But the administration accepted this language because of the inclusion at the end of the phrase in accordance with constitutional processes, which its lawyers believed did not supersede the president's constitutional powers as commander in chief. Again, uh, their view was nothing had changed. 
Um, I would also note that these two sections have never been uh, challenged, um, either through oversight hearings or amendments to the TRA or in court. So uh, the Congress basically accepted uh, what they had passed. Um, having made these and other fixes, uh, the managers of the bill, I think, oversold the bill to um, members of the House and Senate by deceptively claiming that it had successfully asserted congressional power vis-a-vis -vis the executive, where, uh, in fact, um, it really hadn't. However, and this is a big however, uh, even if the TRA as law did not mandate arms sales to Taiwan or constitute the functional equivalent of a defense treaty, the law was and has always been the expression of a broader American policy and political commitment to ensure Taiwan's safety, uh, a commitment that remains powerful to this day. But it's a commitment that must be renewed as uh, new leaders uh, take over and as circumstances change. Now, I do think that a key achievement of the TRA as law, uh, perhaps the key achievement, uh, has to do with opera operationalizing the U.S. commitment to conduct unofficial relations with Taiwan. Uh, and here, the important um, action was authorizing the establishment of the American Institute in Taiwan as the unofficial mechanism through which Washington conducts substantive relations with Taiwan. And Taiwan set up a counterpart uh, mechanism. Um, at its creation, AIT was very much an experiment uh, in both stealth diplomacy and um, organizationally. Um, but there is now general agreement that it has succeeded beyond expectations. It is less than Taiwan would have liked, of course, but Taiwan leaders have accepted that in this case, substance is much more important than form. Um, in essence, uh, Washington's interactions with Taipei are government to government, but behind a facade of unofficiality. Uh, to repeat, in many respects, we treat Taiwan as if it were a state, even if Washington doesn't take an official position that it is. And over time, as circumstances have changed and as the PRC has worried about other matters, the boundaries of unofficiality and as ifness have expanded, uh, certainly expanded beyond what was the case when I was chairman in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, the conduct of relations has become more like that in an official relationship. Five years ago, the Taipei office of AIT opened a brand new office building, which is one of the more handsome diplomatic missions in the State Department's inventory. The American flag flies in front, which was not the case 30 years ago. Uh, the great seal of the United States hangs above the doorway. Uh, U.S. government personnel assigned to um, AIT Taipei no longer have to resign their agency positions and then resume them after their tour is over, as the TRA originally mandated. Um, amid all these changes in the conduct of unofficial U.S.-Taiwan relations, uh, Beijing has never mounted a serious uh, objection or opposition. The structure that the TRA created as a matter of law for the conduct of relations has increasingly been reinforced by a strong political commitment. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you, Richard. Um, that covered um, a huge amount of ground and also opened up for us um, one of the key things that we want to home in on, I think, this morning, which is that the parts of the TRA that usually get the attention, which is the language about Taiwan's defense, um, are, you're arguing, weaker as law in terms of being binding commitments than 
are typically presented, whereas you're directing us to focus our attention on the parts of the TRA that don't get much focus, namely uh, the institution building part, with the creation of the American Institute in Taiwan, the creation of the channels by which the US would continue to be engaging with the authorities in Taiwan, despite no longer having official relationships. So this is an interesting you know, counter narrative to um, what I think is the dominant one now. And so just to pause a little bit on that historical moment, how that emerged, could you talk a little bit about what the what was happening at the time, the context for Congress to be wanting to um, have a separate law that, that, that would um, have something, contain some sort of commitment about Taiwan's defense. And at the same time that uh, relations were established with, with, with the PRC, President Carter uh, abrogated the then existing mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. So there was there was a commitment, there was a firm treaty commitment to Taiwan's defense that was taken away. And so Congress, I think, was trying to compensate for that or make up yes. for that in some way. So if you could talk a little bit about that and also um, what it was that, uh, what was Congress's um, view of Taiwan at the time? I mean, we had uh, trade relations, of course, with Taiwan, but nothing to the extent of today. Taiwan at that time obviously was not making the uh, computer chips, the silicon chips that have become so important in our uh, image of, of the island today and globally uh, important to the global economy. So um, what were the economic and social ties between the U.S. and Taiwan at that time that made Congress determined to um, to preserve Taiwan? Well, there um, were certainly social ties because um, uh, we, even at that time, there were a lot of uh, uh, Taiwan origin people in the United States who had immigrated, uh, who had gone to school here, who were making a contribution to American society um, and uh, some of whom were very interested in the politics of their homeland. Um, I think the important context is more political and ideological, and that is that um, at the time the TRA had to be um, uh, enacted, we had uh, just uh, begun the process of opening our relationship with the PRC. And nobody really had a sense of what it was going to mean in terms of um, China's behavior in East Asia, particularly um, towards Taiwan. Uh, and that um, Taiwan's security had been uh, somewhat at risk ever since uh, Mao Zedong's forces uh, gained control of the mainland in 1949. Uh, we had a tr the treaty, defense treaty with Taiwan, as you um, point out. Um, and so um, because we were placing a bet, Congress felt that we had to hedge that bet by making more clear what our security policy would be towards Taiwan going forward. Um, also, um, it's fair to say that the ROC government was, had grown pretty skilled in, um, exercising influence over members of Congress, uh, and gaining sympathy and support, um, from members, um, uh, for Taiwan and its future. Um, in a way, Congress had been, uh, the... Um, bulwark for Taiwan uh, against um, executive branch um, initiatives uh, that uh, at least the government of Taiwan felt put it at risk. Um, uh, Democrats uh, were um, the ones that uh, the Taiwan government feared most, and uh, but uh, Republicans showed that they could uh, change their mind too. So 
there was that there was the anti-communism that was still uh hanging over uh american views of, of both china and the soviet union um so it um i think it was hedging a bet um i also heard at the time from somebody who was deeply involved in this process within the carter administration that um there was a calculation that um congress would want uh to add something to the tra uh, uh to feel that it had um uh, made a contribution and so um they purposefully left the security section out or a security section out and let congress um, um focus on that hmm. let's dive right into the defense portions in in a bit more detail what does the Taiwan Relations Act require the U.S. government to do for Taiwan's defense? Does it require um, anything? Um, I don't think it does um, because um, it the arms sales policy as, in the TRA is uh, framed as... Uh, within the ambit of the Arms Export Control Act. Um, and <clears throat> uh, that gives the administration the authority to decide what a um, um, uh, friend or ally or partner of the United States needs in terms of uh, weaponry, um, where that fits in the larger diplomatic relationship with the um, uh, countries in the region. Uh, whether it has uh, the absorptive capacity for those weapons. Um, but the, the language of the TRA does not specify the level of uh, arm sales, the, um, which wep types of weapon systems should uh, be included in the list. Uh, there were efforts to put that in, but uh, they were sort of taken out in the uh, legislative process. Um, somebody from the Pentagon once said to me, you know, if you just look at uh, the TRA with a cold eye, um, you could interpret it to mean that Taiwan needs nothing. You know, if that's a judgment of the administration, um, um, nothing requires um, uh, that a uh, certain amount be provided. Now, no administration would do that. Uh, there is a threat. Um, there is politics. Um, but um, in terms of sort of a specific binding requirement, I don't think it exists. Hmm. So People if... who say it does uh, don't know what they're talking about. Right. Well, <laughs> that is the, the most common language that we hear. So just this week, um the White House announced that um, it had approved a $2 billion, a new $2 billion sale of weapons to Taiwan. Um, and th these, these, are, these transactions are always in the form of sales, not, not gifts or donations. Uh, and this one includes, I think for the first time, advanced surface to air missile defense system. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reporting on it as is typical in these situations, usually has had language around the idea that this was mandatory. So CNN's report said, uh, the US is Taiwan's strongest unofficial ally and its laws bind it to provide Taiwan with the means to defend itself. Um, the reporter used the wrong verb, um, mm. bind, um, that it doesn't. The law mm -hmm. doesn't bind it. it you know, we um, do this um, as a matter of policy. Um, I would note that in the last couple of years, Congress has passed legislation uh, that authorizes uh, granting loans to Taiwan and even grants uh, to help it purchase um, U.S. military equipment. And it's it's no longer just cash on the barrel. 
uh, which is a step forward. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that the PRC has not reacted um, more than it has, which is not very much. Um, um, hmm. But that's interesting. I don't know why. Some people have assessed that the weapons, well, the TRA and the weapons that have been provided to Taiwan by the U.S., uh, either pursuant to the TRA in their view or independently, that these are the reasons that the PRC has not used force to date to uh, gain control of Taiwan. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Um, for sure, um, U.S. deterrence um, has dissuaded a PRC from considering uh, use of force uh, to achieve its political objective concerning Taiwan. Um, Taiwan's own military contributes to that deterrence. Um, and that has always been a factor. Um, however, uh, I think it's also true that um, Beijing un has understood how hard it would be uh, to, for example, um, conduct an amphibious invasion of Taiwan. This is the hardest military operation uh, that any um, military can undertake. Uh, moreover, I think that um, Beijing has made the correct calculation that um, uh, Taiwan constitutes um, potential contributions to uh, China's um, economic growth and modernization um, to have access to the advanced chip production of TSMC and other companies, I think would allow um, um, Chinese companies to leapfrog a couple of uh, levels of technological development um, and move forward and be much more competitive. So the assumption since 1979, illusory or not, was that uh, somehow enough incentives can be formulated by Beijing uh, to get um, Taiwan to agree to unification on China's terms. Um, that has never worked out. One of the key reasons is that Taiwan became a democracy in the early 90s. Uh, Um, and so the people of Taiwan gained a seat at the table of any negotiations, um, I think. Um, and the, the worry, I guess, is that because China has not been able to gain its objective through negotiations, it may resort to um, force um, um, as the only alternative. I think actually it is... Um, uh, uh, using a different approach and has used a different approach uh, for more than eight years, and that is coercion, which is sort of in between um, persuasion on the one hand and warfare on the other. Um, and um, it has a certain impact. Um, but um, the, the one thing that the PRC has not done even in the wake of strong opposition to its term, Beijing's terms for unification, is make Taiwan a better offer. Um, and there are reasons for that. Uh, but you would think that, uh, um, you know, if you're, you bang your head against the wall once, twice, three times, that you would um, stop banging your head against the wall. So I'm going to start taking some audience questions in just a minute, and I see there are some already. Um, the place to put your questions is in the Q&A um, function on Zoom. Please don't use the chat. Um, but I just, <clears throat> before doing that, I want to quickly ask a bit about what the U.S. position is on Taiwan's status, which is to say uh, independence, 
of Taiwan, uh, its status via the uh, mainland China. The Department of State website has a page on Taiwan in which it says clearly, we do not support Taiwan independence. But the Taiwan Relations Act actually doesn't mention Taiwan independence or whether Taiwan is a state or not a state. There's nothing, there's no language on that at all. It says only that the US policy is that Taiwan's future should be determined peacefully and that the human rights of its people should be respected. And there's use of the phrase peace and stability several times. And that phrase of course is repeated frequently in, in other um, documents between the US and China. Um, why didn't the Taiwan Relations Act mention Taiwan's status, including whether or not it, um, it already should be considered independent or should be given an opportunity to become independent if not already independent? Why is that missing from the law? I don't recall in my research uh, reading that um, this was an issue um, on the minds of members. Um, there was a desire by um, Senator Claiborne Pell to get something about um, human rights in there, not specifically political status. Um, but uh, what uh, was uh, eventually included in the bill was um, kind of weak. Um, the uh, if there was any consideration to this, I think uh, the uh, realization would be that um, it's in the president's power to decide whether a specific territory is within the sovereign territory of uh, a country with which we're establishing diplomatic relations. And um, the communique or agreement or MOU by which two countries recognize each other and establish diplomatic relations is the place that one country would express reservations on territorial issues uh, regarding the other. So <clears throat> in the normalization communique of 1978, um, I think we did express a reservation when we said the United States acknowledges, not recognizes, acknowledges the Chinese position, whatever that is, that there is one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. Uh, and so the clear implication of this is that uh, the legal status of Taiwan uh, has yet to be determined. Uh, and that was a position that goes back, as you know, to the Korean War. Um, there was a later um, statement by, I, I think it was probably drafted by the um, State Department's Office of Legal Advisor that um, the um, Taiwan's uh, legal status will be determined through negotiations between the PRC and the ROC, or between Beijing and Taipei. Um, so um, this is not a, um, you, you, you then get into prostrate uh, relations and possibility of any negotiations. I think that the um, the reason for taking this exception or making this reservation in the normalization communique was twofold. One, if we said that it is the US position that Taiwan is a part of China or that um, we really would be agreeing with the PRC that Taiwan was an internal affair. And um, we did not want to take that position. Uh, to say uh, that we only acknowledge the position um, continued to um, 
allowed us to continue to treat Taiwan as a matter for international peace and security. Um, moreover, um, I think the judgment was that if you say that Taiwan is legally a part of China, then under international law, you really can't sell arms to Taiwan mm -hmm. because you're selling weapons to a political force that is opposed to or in conflict with uh, the government that you recognize and accept is the government of that territory. Right. So next week, uh, when we host um, Peter Dutton uh, to talk about international law, we're going to get further into some of these questions of what international law has to say. And I noticed that a number of the, the questions that have been posted already in the in the Q&A uh, queue have to do with international law. And I regret to say we want to sort of steer away from that this week because we're going to address it next week. So if some of you are asking international law questions, uh, I hope you'll come back on November 7th when we when we do get into that. Um, well, and Peter's the uh, leading American expert on this subject. The um, there was something um, a policy that you refer to in, in the wonderful document that you wrote a few years ago called the One China Policy Primer, which we provided a link for in our um, in our uh, event announcement on our website. Uh, those of you who um, are in, uh, have, have looked at that page will find a link there as well as a few other writings uh, by Richard there. In this One China Policy Primer, you talk about a US policy of dual deterrence that the US government exercised primarily it seems during the 90s and the early 80s in which, um, in addition to seeking to deter any kind of um, aggression from uh, Beijing's side towards Taiwan, the U.S. was also actively discouraging the government of Taiwan from making statements or taking actions that it thought could be perceived as steps toward independence or departing from the status quo or basically rocking the boat. Uh, in this delicate relationship um, across the straits. Uh, so this even included, um, according to reports at the time, it included the US vetting the inauguration speech of then Taiwan President Chen Shui-bian, um, who was seen widely as being very aggressive in, in his uh, promotion of Taiwan's separate identity. Um, I don't see anything in the Taiwan Relations Act that touches on this, um, not surprisingly, on this aspect of things. Um, does the US have any kind of commitment to help uh, preserve the status quo and specifically to discourage Taiwan from taking any measures that might be seen as departing from the status quo. And I ask this in part because um, the current, the new president of Taiwan, President Lai, has given a couple of speeches which seem to be more strongly worded than the speeches of his predecessor, President Tsai, uh, in the emphasis on Taiwan's uh, separate identity, keeps uh, calling it Taiwan. There was a point in the 1990s where simply calling the island Taiwan as opposed to the Republic of China was seen as somewhat inflammatory or provocative. Now it seems to be accepted. Uh, President Lai has certainly leaned into using uh, the, ident the, the label or the name of Taiwan rather than Republic of China uh, and also has talked about um, uh, the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China being on equal footing which some say harkens back to what President Li Donghui had said in the 90s in terms of state-to-state -state relations across the uh, Taiwan Strait. And at that time, when President Li Donghui said that, it was seen as very provocative. <clears throat> but there hasn't been, uh, to my knowledge, any kind of remonstration from Washington to these statements by President Lai. 
Uh, is dual deterrence a thing of the past? Uh, not at all. Um, uh, dual deterrence is very circumstance uh, driven and circumstances change. Um, I would note that um, before Taiwan became a democracy, um, there was nothing needed beyond single deterrence. The only real threat uh, to peace and secure stability that um, existed was the possibility of a PRC attack against Taiwan. Um, but uh, with democratization, that opened up the political system and um, that um, allowed new ideas to um, be expressed in Taiwan, um, including eventually advocacy for de jure independence, setting up a separate Taiwan state. Uh, this was controversial in Taiwan itself. Uh, there were a variety of views. There still are a variety of views. Um, the United States um, took a, I think, a practical approach to this. Um, we did not want uh, the situation to deteriorate in such a way that it would lead to war. We still don't want that. Um, and so we realized um, in the context of the late 1990s that um, even as we warned Beijing not to use force, uh, which we do, um, we needed to um, uh, warn Taiwan not to take political actions that, you know, however they might be justified, would provoke uh, an attack. And um, the, um, I think there was a sufficient concern that a declaration of independence, for example, would um, lead to a PRC attack. Uh, the I um, would say that uh, um, which obviously um, you can calibrate your warnings to each side, you can calibrate your reassurance to each side, depending on um, who's making more trouble. So I think we are in an era right now where the PRC is the one who is acting aggressively against Taiwan. Um, and there are different views on, on how provocative Taiwan is acting. Um, there are a variety of ways to um, express concerns or express warnings or convey reassurance. Uh, it doesn't all have to be done through public declaratory policy. Um, it could be done, it can be done through diplomacy. Um, and we have a robust diplomatic uh, interaction with Taiwan. Uh, we have an excellent team there. Um, we believe um, that um, when a... Um, friend and partner of the United States is uh, uh, when when a, a leader of a place like Taiwan is uh, unclear in his or her intentions, the way to clarify the situation is to engage them. PRC takes a different position. If it doesn't like or if it suspects the intentions of a Taiwan leader, it uh, um, uh, shuts off any communication, it demonizes the person, and so on. Uh, not a constructive approach, to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think there has been an evolution in how Taiwan leaders and the public um, feel about this situation. Um, and that is, um, there's a clear... I think a pretty clear understanding on the part of, of um, the public that if the um, if um, Taiwan declared independence, there would be war, and U.S. intervention on behalf of of Taiwan would not be certain. Uh, I think 
Um, most leaders understand that. Um, President Tsai certainly did. Um, um, President Lai, um, I think, has been feeling his way on how to talk about these issues. Um, but uh, I also think that um, we are in a position so we can um, shape his thinking, shaping, shape his speech. Um, he is a politician. He has to operate in a political universe. And uh, so um, some of his remarks are not going to be things that the PRC um, wants to hear. Um, so dual deterrence is alive and well. How it's being practiced uh, today is not the same as it was in um, the late 1990s. I, by the one who was, I, by the way, was the one whom the Clinton administration uh, sent uh, to Taiwan to complain um, uh, after Lee Dong Wei made his uh, so called two state theory remarks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, it was a tough trip, but mm. we got through it. Mm. So one of the questions that's been uh, raised is for you to comment on recent legislation that has been introduced in Congress on Taiwan. Um, I know I did a search before this talk to see what was how many bills had been introduced in Congress this session during this this year and last year, and I found forty two bills that had Taiwan in the name. Uh, in addition, there were quite a few resolutions that had been proposed, but just legislation, there were 42 of them. There's the uh, Taiwan Relations Reinforcement Act, the Protect Taiwan Act, the Taiwan Invasion Protection Act, the Taiwan Security Act, the Taiwan International Solidarity Act, Stand with Taiwan Act, and so on. Those are just a few. Um, so what is your assessment of this legislation? Well, to assess any uh, of these pieces of legislation, you have to read the fine print mm -hmm. um, and see what their purpose is, but also be very cognizant of the language that is used. Um, congressional legislation, even if it has the name bill or act attached to it, um, may just... Um, um, for the most part, um, express sentiments or make suggestions or authorize something that's already going to be done. Um, it can prohibit things. That That is a binding order. Um, and what makes um, Taiwan legislation um, problematic sometimes is when it is expressed in the form of an order and when the executive branch feels it has no choice but to carry out that order. Um, my um, sort of survey of the legislation that's been um, uh, introduced over the last few years, I haven't gone through each bill in detail, is that uh, a lot of it is um, expression of sentiment, um, um, and um, making suggestions, often the there's one requirement in the bill, one order, and that is to submit a report. Congress mm -hmm. does have the power to submit a report. And mm -hmm. uh, this creates a huge burden on the executive branch people who have to write the report. The reports mm -hmm. are not res necessarily read. I can attest to that personally, uh, based on experience. Um, and it it does uh, sort of um, uh, pull uh, executive branch officials from the work that I wish they really were uh, had time to do. Hmm. But um, it um, a lot of this the the fact that that bills like this are introduced um, can um, cause concern in Beijing. Um, and uh, it can uh, boost uh, um, confidence in Taiwan. Um, I think the PRC has enough good lawyers so that they can 
read the bills as introduced and figure out uh, mm -hmm. what's serious and what's not in terms mm -hmm. of PRC interests. Mm -hmm. Another question is about, um, this is going back to the arms sales um, topic, about statements uh, made by Ronald Reagan um, guaranteeing that the U.S. would continue arms sales to Taiwan. Um, the, of course, Reagan made some statements and commitments, and there also have been other uh, policy-type commitments made by various U.S. presidents over the years. Um, in your uh, writings, you refer to these as the sacred texts. Um, is What was it that Reagan, President Reagan committed to with respect to arms sales, and is this one of the sacred texts? Um, you're referring to the August 1982 communique uh, uh, concerning arms sales. It was the issue that was left over from normalization. Um, and what the um, what the communique says, um, and I think it was a terrible communique, but it, what it says is that uh, the United States would uh, cap um, quality and quantity of arms sales to Taiwan, and then would um, gradually reduce um, the value of arms sales um, till a final resolution, whatever that meant. Um, and this um, did cause a lot of concern um, um, because it suggested that maybe um, um, Taiwan over time would become weaker and weaker and more vulnerable uh, to PRC action. Um, the end result was that because of changing circumstances, particularly uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and the available availability to the PLA of uh, advanced uh, weapon systems from Russia, um, it was felt that um, um, the United States just had to go ahead and act in ways that some, including the PRC, might say were uh, contrary to the spirit, if not the letter, of that communique. Um, so the first major one was F-16s uh sales uh which was announced in 1970 mm -hmm. um i think that that communique is essentially a dead letter um mm -hmm. it may have been sacred at the time but um not any longer not any longer yeah. and um it it was our commitments at the time were premised on a belief that uh, China really was going to pursue a peaceful policy. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, that premise is uh, debatable um, by now um, in terms of PRC capabilities and in terms of some PRC behavior. Mm -hmm. With respect to the sacred texts, I mean, there are, um, you mentioned the three U.S. China communiques, so 1972, 1978, 1982, and then there were the so-called six assurances that the U.S. made to Taiwan in 1982, and the TRA itself, of course, and then various other formulations of expressions, set set mm -hmm. terms, almost carved in stone type phrases that the U.S. has employed over the years. You, you call these, or at least I understood you to mean that these are, this compromise, this is the body of sacred text, uh, and that the priesthood, as you put it, of Americans who understand these texts is getting smaller over time, naturally, because there are fewer people still active in government who were there at the creation and understand, as you do, how they were formulated and what the intention was and so on. We have a new generation of political leaders who are responding to the situation of the moment. So 
why should they know about or respect these sacred texts? Um, why shouldn't they simply respond to the exigencies of the moment, uh, the change circumstances on both sides of the strait, Taiwan having become a democracy, which it definitely was not at the time of um, the TRA, uh, and Beijing, on the other hand, possibly having changed its calculus toward Taiwan, uh, but certainly having become much more powerful uh, and uh, both economically and militarily dominant, why shouldn't our policymakers uh, be responding to all of this as opposed to looking back at the sacred texts? Well, I think um, our policymakers, in fact, have been responding to changes in circumstances um, ever since um, uh, these communiques and other documents were um, drafted and um, established. Um, maybe not as fast as we should have reacted, um, maybe not as precisely as we should have, but uh, I think we have. Um, um, I think one reason that um, it is um, we have to um, maintain a commitment to some of these is that um, they are, are still in certain ways operative. Um, the normalization communique, um, which I think is the most important of the three USPRC communiques, um, lays out uh, some pretty strong commitments about um, what the government in Beijing is and uh, how we're going to deal with the government in Taipei and, and so on and so on. Um, and that's never changed. Uh, and to... Um, so renege on the commitments we made then would have uh, some important consequences. Um, the I think both um, Beijing and Taipei um, take comfort in the fact that we are recommitting uh, with each administration the documents that they like. Um, so Beijing wants a uh, new administration to recommit to the three communiques um, and the one China policy. Um, Taiwan likes to hear us recommit to the TRA and the six assurances. Um, and we accommodate to that. But, um, you know, for us... Um, uh, even though these um, sacred texts form a certain context, uh, it's it's the reality of the moment that we are dealing with. Um, I think in in the process, our understanding of what some of the original terms mean has evolved. Um, you know, President Carter uh, expressed uh, the expectation that cross-strait differences would be resolved peacefully. Well, I, I, to my mind, at least, we need to think about two different aspects of peaceful. Um, number one, is it nonviolent? And number two, um, is it voluntarily on the part of Taiwan leaders and the Taiwan public? I mean, these were um, the the second of these was not something that that occurred to anybody at the time um, that President. Carter made his statement because um, Taiwan was very different then. Um, but um, I think that um, those distinctions are relevant now and um, you can see it um, seeping into um, US policy statements. So um, with your indulgence, I have gone over our declared time. We should have okay. ended a few minutes ago, but I appreciate your willingness to stay on. Uh, there's still a lot of people uh, who have stuck with us as well. Um, so if you uh, 
Will, I'd just like to close with one final um, question was raised in the by the audience, which sure. is which could be as simple as a yes, no. And I want to raise it because it is relevant um, to uh, the election that we have next week. Um, and the question is whether to confirm, is it accurate that as a practical matter at president at present, the, the US president alone decides the extent of US assistance to Taiwan and for security purposes. Is that a, a fair summary of your view? Um, the, um, it's a little more complicated than that. I mean, when I say the president, I really mean the executive branch. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the process is that um, the Department of Defense, in consultation with uh, Taiwan's military leaders and uh, uh, based on its own assessment of the um, defense situation vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis China, um, uh, receives a request from the Taiwan side for things that uh, they would like to acquire. Um, the Pentagon makes uh, its own judgment of what is needed. That is uh, discussed in the interagency process. Um, and then a final decision is made um, as to what to offer Taiwan. Now- um, by, by the president. By, by the president, yes. Mm -hmm. um, the There can be political pressures from Congress, from defense contractors and others as this process has gone along, and it can change uh, the, um, the outcomes. Uh, there was lobbying in 1992 that led uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush uh, in the context of the 1992 election campaign to um, um, decide to provide F-16s to Taiwan. Um, the, where was I going with this? The, um, once uh, the president um, makes a decision and the arms sales are notified to Congress, then Congress has 60 days, 30 days, uh to um try to pass a uh, resolution of disapproval if it if there is um desire to do so and it's subject to um special expedited procedures um it is a a measure that is like a law so if a majority of both houses passes it and uh, it gets sent to the president, uh, the president can veto it, and then um, Congress is in a position where it has to try to override. Um, mm. So Congress does have a role, but as I suggested before, the role is uh, mainly at the end of the process, mm. um, not at the beginning, which is what I think that some people in Congress wanted in 1979. It also sounds like in the in the example that you provided, Congress could be a break, but not an initiator. So if the president declined to take action, there doesn't seem to be an equivalent mechanism for Congress to say, well, actually, we want you to take action and to compel the president to take action. Um, uh, that's, that's correct. Um, I don't know of, of a case where um, I think there's certainly lobbying and and um, sort of pressures from members of Congress, um, pressures from defense contractors who are who are allied with members of Congress, um, and um, the administration would have to make a judgment as to um, whether to um, change its mind and go along with that uh, request. Um, given all the circumstances, um, you know, that that would be um, a tough call. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, there, um, 
I think I have this right, that the suggestion that the U.S. provide financing for Taiwan to purchase more weapons uh, actually came from the Congress. But in this case, it was one that the administration liked um, because it allowed us to transfer more of what we thought Taiwan needed. Oh. So thank you very much for uh, allowing us to go long. This has been a fascinating conversation. And given the number of questions that have been posted in the queue, we could carry on for quite a bit, but I wanna be respectful of your time and everyone in the audience's time. Uh, thank you so much, I've, I've learned a great deal. Uh, I wanna invite everyone to join us next week, uh, Thursday, November 7th uh, from 12.30 PM uh, New York time for the next installment in our series, which will be what does international law say about Taiwan? And the speaker will be Peter Dutton, a senior research scholar at the Paul Tsai Center, China Center at Yale Law School. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Catherine.